Hello. Hey, I want to say your last name because I just learned how to say it appropriately, phonetically. It's not Tracy Graziani. It's Tracy Graziani. Tracy Graziani. Yep. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to talk to you again. We got some time to talk right before we started. I'm really excited to talk to you. Um, man, I don't even realize or remember how we got connected, who suggested we talk to. Maybe it's not relevant. But as soon as I talked to you, I was like, oh, we should do a podcast together. And here we are a few weeks later talking. Tell everybody where you are in the world and what you're up to. Sure. I am Tracy Graziani and I am in Cleveland, Ohio. And I own Graziani Multimedia. And we are a HubSpot agency partner. Mm -hmm. And we specialize in working with category creating companies, a lot of them in sustainability. And typically, uh, they're also purpose driven. So they are concerned about making the world a better place. Yeah, a lot, a lot of people nowadays, they talk about, I think that's the joke in tech, is people like, we make, you know, blah, 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 software, and we make the world a better place. But truly, by the by virtue of the way your company is set up, you literally are working to make the world a better place. Your, your, your company is what's called a B Corp. It's a B Corporation. And we have a lot of different types of folks that listen to this podcast. Will you let folks know, like, what is a B Corp and why did you decide to go down this path? And we're going to get into how you ended up where you are, what makes you such an amazing, you know, founder and, and owner. But what is a B Corp to start? So a benefit corporation, depending on what state you're in, is either a actual legal entity, just like an LLC, a C-Corp, et cetera, or in the state of Ohio, it's not a legal entity, uh, but it is a company that uh, looks at uh, people, planet, and profit. And the idea is that you never make a profit at the expense of people on the planet. So sometimes they call it a triple bottom line business. So instead of the bottom line just being money, we also look at what we do and how it impacts people on the planet. And there is a international organization that certifies uh, B corporations. And we're actually in the process of getting our certification. It's a difficult process. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get to just say, uh, oh, I we're we're good people. We're a we're a benefit corporation. So when you see the B Corp seal on a product or on a company's website, you know that they have been very stringently vetted and they actually do the things that they say they do. And there you, there's a score that oh. that you're given and you have to score a certain amount on your on your assessment in order to be qualified. So actually, to, to be honest, we uh, we did not qualify the first time. And they gave us like, here's the things you have to improve. And I was a little surprised because I'm like, but we're, we're like, we're good people. We're a good business. <laughs> like, we, we do the right things. Um, but, but we had some opportunities uh, to grow and, and they told us what we needed to do and we're working on those things and we'll go back. So, you know, they look at things like are people being paid a living wage and, you know, how do you handle your supply chain and your materials? And I mean, they get very, very granular on everything from your benefits to what you do with your waste. So, so there's a conscious choice that you made. And we, again, we, we will talk shortly about entrepreneurship, owning your own business, how you even decided to do that. We know that it's not easy. We know that it's a challenge and it comes with a whole lifestyle change. But in doing so, you said it wasn't enough to work for yourself, own your own business. You wanted to make this conscious choice to go the B Corporation route. Um, why is that important to you? And how did that become important to you? It took me a minute to get there. Um, like most people, I'd never heard of a benefit corporation to begin with. So there's that. I actually started out my career in nonprofits like you. I started out in education. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was an art teacher in an inner city school and which had left behind past. And my kids were being failed by a system, not by the teachers in that yeah. building or any of the things that that law, you know, wanted to imply. Um, and I knew they were going to be negatively impacted by that legislation. And I was pretty horrified by it since it was so testing heavy. Right. And our kids had so many deficits that made testing really difficult. So I went to grad school and I was like, I'm going to like do research to prove that testing is bad, you know, and I'm going to like change the world, you know. And then 
I think my first or second class in grad school, I found that all of that research already existed. We already knew <laughs> that standardized tests were biased yep. and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. produced bad outcomes and all of these things. This research was completely unnecessary. Um, there were other factors at play that were making the, the education climate what it had become. And so then I'm like, well, now what am I going to do? And, and I had to have a master's degree to keep my license and to keep teaching. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I still have to get a master's. So what am I going to do now? So I studied educational psychology and Oof. my research was in creativity theory. Um, <laughs> Sidebar, you just booked another hour talk with me after this for this thing that I'm working on. Oh my gosh. I forgot about I'm writing a note. I'm writing a note right now. Sorry. You just bought another hour. Okay. So, um, so while I was in grad school and, you know, doing research and those kinds of things, I, my kids were really under-resourced in my school for education people. My school is one of the schools that's listed in Jonathan Kosel's Savage Inequalities. Like that's who my kids were. Like there was, there was a lot of need. And so I, you know, was writing grants to get resources for the kids. Mm -hmm. All these things ended up with getting a grant for our entire district to get all of the teachers in our district trained on a cognitive psychology based arts curriculum called visual thinking strategies and took all of the art teachers for the district to the have a book up here called visual meetings and thinking <laughs> literally. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Very so, good. so, you know, and BTS is like a, it's a, a dialectical uh, cognitive psychology tactic for uh, teaching kids uh, teaching kids critical thinking through talking about art. Uh, and that's a really like reductive way to describe it. Okay. But, uh, so we, we had a training at the Detroit Institute of Arts. Uh, at this point, I'm like, what, like 23 years old or something. I'm just, like just out of college. And all the art teachers are at the Detroit Institute of Arts. We're getting this training from the head of the education department there. And two or three days in, she pulls me aside and she's like, what are you doing for lunch? And I was like, I don't know. And she's like, you're having a lunch with me. And she's like, my head of studio programming just took a job at another nonprofit. I need somebody to run my studio programs. I want you to apply for the job. Sounds cool. And I was like, well, that's kind of cool. And so at 23 years old, I was middle management at one of the biggest museums in the world. Wow. Um, Wow. And so real quickly, like uh, things changed. Uh, and so I worked in nonprofits for a while and I really loved them, but nonprofits have certain dysfunctions, you know, and challenges. And when you're really obsessed with change and fixing things and making the world better, I found myself very frustrated by some of those limitations. Yeah. Then I worked in business for a while and in many ways, I was like, this is different. Like there's a certain kind of logic to things. If things don't work, you change, you move on, you know, like the, there's a little bit more plasticity here, but that whole part where like the ends justify the means just didn't sit right with me. <laughs> sort of the, the well, like, so like you didn't, you're like, ah, education is too messy. Like business is objective, you're like, but it doesn't sit right with my heart now. So it's like. You're like these Venn diagrams of overlapping things that you needed. We're like, try. it's interesting. Right. Like you're trying, there's a whole thing too. I need to ask you leaving kids. And I don't like to say it that way. And I just no, had a conversation right. yesterday with a dude whose wife is a teacher. She's like, she's burnt out and it's, it's right. killing her. And he's like, and I said, Hey buddy, I've talked to a lot in council, a lot of people about leaving education, going into other things. And I said, one, they're going to replace you the next day. So if you leave today, they'll have a teacher in their mouth number. But the hardest thing is the emotional element of leaving education, right? It's, it's nothing more. It's just, it is emotional. It is your heart. There's an altruistic desire to, like you said, make the world a better place, advocate for these children, give them the opportunities they didn't have. And when we leave to go do something else, it, that is an emotional decision. So how did you manage that decision? Was it as quick as going to the lunch and be like, Hey, it sounds pretty cool. I'm out. Or did it, did it take a minute to make the decision? Um, the, the job at the museum was like this transition, right? Mm -hmm. Because I went from being a teacher to still being involved with a higher purpose in the work that I was doing at the museum. So 
So I went from having a school where I had 360 students to uh, running a program that uh, every uh, fourth and fifth grade student in Detroit public schools got to come for museum learning uh, for four weeks out of their school year. We have a lot and of crossover, so, by the way. We have a ton and so I of got crossover. to have this huge impact, right? And then we also did programs for veterans and people in outpatient mental health. And so at that point, the calculation was my impact goes from this to this. Yes, you scale it right? up. Yeah. So it was it was very it still felt the part you said though, right? Like I actually did leave during a school year, which is like felt really wrong. My father was a career educator and uh, administrator, I felt like I was doing something really wrong to like leave in, I left in September. It was like the beginning of the school year, but, um, so I did kind of feel bad about that. Um, but I, I had, I was a marketer and I didn't know it yet. I I ran a newsletter at, at the school, mm-hmm. um, paper newsletter. Cause this was a long time ago. And, uh, and so I li- I literally did like a newsletter that went home to all the kids that, you know, said, Hey, I'm leaving. And, and, you know, if you want to find me here, I am, I'm going to be at the museum. And by the way, you know, when I was a kid, my favorite book was, you know, from the mixed up files of Mrs. Basilie Frank. Dude, are you well- serious? Dude, hold up. Stop podcast. <laughs> if you're listening, continue to listen. Holy shit. You and I like legit are, we're like 90% the same person, right? classroom teacher leaves to have a bigger impact still in and they like museum education got it the i can't read very well like i never did as a kid i've read like 10 books in my life i reread i reread the mixed up from the mixed up files of miss basley frank Weller. i reread it five years ago because i was like i should be reading but books are hard and i'm like i love that book and i went back and i reread it that is insane I just love, uh, I love the whole idea of it as a kid was like so magical. The whole idea, I loved museums and I loved art and like to actually kind of like live live in a museum. Oh my gosh. So cool, right? Yeah. And you know, the way they would hide and all the stuff. Like I loved everything about it. And so to tell it for for me to find out I'm going to get to go to a museum every day and like that's going to be my work like my second home is going to be this place I I legit like get to be with those people and I get to go in deep storage and I get to do all these things right like it was it's huge. magical so, yeah it is a magical thing it, and there wasn't a day and it was the worst job I've ever had by the way but <laughs> there wasn't a day that I didn't feel incredibly grateful and privileged to just be there. And on my absolute worst day, I could go sit in Rivera court surrounded by Diego Rivera's murals and be like, I, I belong here. Like I'm, I'm one the of ID. the, people. you got the ID you know? to prove. And like, yeah. yeah. And like on, on my shittiest day, I get to come here. You know, and that beats crying in a walk-in cooler when you're a waitress, like, hands down, you know? (sighs) Something, like, interesting there, right? So, like, um, this this journey, right? Your father was a career educator. I'm sure that played into, like, your desire to be an educator. You find this injustice. You're trying to find the data to support that testing is bullshit because of no child left behind. You go down that path. You're like, hey, they already figured it out. What am I going to do now? And then this just leads you to all these really unique places. Um, and there's this, I don't know what it's called and I don't know how to best say it other than like elements that attract people to places, people, and things that are not always, um, maybe like on the menu, right? So like maybe your job, maybe people that would have applied for the job at the museum might've been like, oh, I can do the roles and responsibilities very well, right? Or I, that job description is what I have, or maybe it was the pay or maybe it was whatever, but like. There was this other thing that drew you there and excited you that like wasn't on the menu. It probably wasn't on the job description to be like, you get to be among the coolest stuff in the world every day. But this was like this fringe benefit that like attracted you to it. And that's I really never cool. would have applied for that job right? if I hadn't been asked to apply for it. Like and I think that's when we get to talking about business and things, you know, my parents are great people. I I was very privileged to have things other kids never have. You know, my parents gave a shit about me. Mm -hmm. And the the truth is that's not a given. 
And there isn't a, there, you know, there isn't a minute of my life, especially the older I get and the more people I meet, the more truly broken people I meet that I realize that I, at a, I just started out on second base because, you know, I had, I had parents who, who cared, you know? Um, but I also grew up in the Midwest in a very tradi- in a small town in a very traditional community and the women in my family had not gotten educations. The men had, but the women had not. Everybody said I was smart and capable, but nobody ever said, Hey, Tracy, you could be the president or you could be doctor or you could be a lawyer or you could be a, nobody ever had any bigger dreams for me than being a mom, you know? And not that there's anything wrong with that. And it, it, you know, it's funny when you talk about leaving the kids, like I don't think I ever would have had children if I stayed a teacher. Because so much of my energy went into those kids. I had nothing left at the end. of When I was a teacher, before I had kids, I would always tell parents, I mean, I will treat your children as if they are my own. And, And I tried, I did what I thought, but it wasn't until I had kids where I'm like, oh shit, I'm not like, this is, there's a, you can say it, you could do what you think, but until you have uh, your own kids, it's a really different conversation. It's, 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 yeah. it's just I different. Mean, and life is full of those things. Right. So, so yeah. So I knew I was really fortunate to have that job and there were, and I said, it was the worst job ever. People hated me. Like, I mean, <laughs> there were people who had worked their whole careers to get to the same level I was after 20 years. And I was invited in and, and I didn't have to work my way up. I just got installed at a really good job at a really good place, you know, and it's crazy. And, and, and like, you know, and, and believe you, you want to know in poly guy, that's how imposter syndrome works. Believe me, because there were people who literally were telling me I didn't belong there, you know? Yeah. And, and I, but you know, and, and I was managing people. The youngest member of my staff was 10 years older than me. Man. And I, I nothing about managing people. I had never thought about leadership. I had never imagined myself in any kind of job like that. I became a teacher because when I, you know, my mom did want me to go to college. She didn't go to, you know, she didn't go to college. She wanted me to go to college, but they were like, you'll be a teacher or a nurse, right? Like those were the things like just people didn't dream dream for me, but Nancy Jones, you know, met me at a training and she saw something in me that I didn't see in me and I wouldn't be where I am today if somebody else hadn't said, I think you can do this really cool thing and you belong here. Oh, it existed. Like you said, you wouldn't have applied for it, but like. We're... I wouldn't have looked for it. I yeah. wouldn't have known to look for it. Like, obviously on some level, I mean, I was an adult, obviously people work at museums. Right. But, but I'm sure that in my head, like those were very special people, you know, All right, I, I need to, I, I need to give a shout out. I have to give a shout out to Dee Dee Ludwig. Dee Dee, if you're listening to this particular episode, thank you. I owe you everything. I love you. Thank you for taking a chance on me back in 2005 or four. But she was my Nancy Jones. I applied to be in this program at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. I am not a bright person. I was a Chicago public school teacher and I applied to this program and I got a thing. You're on the waiting list. And I was like, I, I, I called, I called every day. Hey, can I talk to who's in charge? And finally they got sick. Dee Dee tells the story. She got sick of me calling. I was like, all right, this guy's in, just put him in. And from that, my life completely changed. And so people, you know, it's cool. We're talking about the jobs, the places, the way we thought about the things that we did. And at the end of the day, there's people that made these, all these things possible. The Nancy Joneses, as you said, of the world. Um, I took an assessment in high school. They, they had us take the ASVAB <laughs> to tell us like what you should be when you grow up. And it said that if I got an education, that I should be an engineer. And if I went to trade school, I should be a mechanic. Interesting. And, and those were things that were guy things, right? Like those were, those were dude jobs. And so, it was laughable to my friends and my family, like me, an engineer, like <laughs> me, an auto mechanic, like my friends started calling me Gus as a joke because oh like, that's what an auto mechanic would be called. Right. Like, like I, you know, 
it never occurred to me that I could ever be an engineer. And I took a test that said I could. It's you know? crazy. And then, okay, so educator, back to grad school, doing research, getting this grant. Now you meet Nancy Jones. Then you're at the, the, the museum for a while. And then you leave there and you said you, you go into business. Where do you go after the museum? Right. So, you know, 2008 happened. Um, and everything kind of falls apart. And I had to have a job. So I, in a span of six months... Um, I, my husband at the time, uh, and I got divorced, my home went into foreclosure and I was laid off of my job. Oh my. And so I literally lost everything. And so I was like, what can I do? You know? And I applied to every museum job and they're, and at that point they're phasing art out of school. So there's no, there's no teaching jobs. Right. Mm -hmm. So I applied to every job I could everywhere, reached out to the few people I'd met in my career, you know, in museums. I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't get networking that much yet at that point in my career. So I never thought about the fact that someday I might need a network, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and I was just kind of like super depressed, right? It was a bad time. So I was like, what do I, what can I do if I can't do what I've always done and what I know how to do? And so I was, I got a, I got a sales job. Were, so, you, in, were you in Michigan at the time still? I went until I was homeless. Yes. <laughs> Putting it that way. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so my family's in Ohio and again, like just extreme privilege, you know, my grandfather owns many rental properties. And so I, packed up my house and I moved into a duplex that had been in my family for like a hundred years. Wow. And, um, and I got a sales job. And so I sold furniture for a little bit. I got fired from that job. It fired. That's a good thing sometimes, right? First time I'd ever been fired. That was something. And then I ended up being a, a makeup artist, which by the way is also commissioned sales. Um, because I was looking, I needed, I needed healthcare. Okay. And so, uh, the department stores give healthcare within 30 days or back then a lot of the department stores, you could get healthcare within 30 days. So it was like, okay, what can I do? Where can I get a job that has healthcare? Uh, this was before the affordable care act. I'm diabetic. So I had to find some Are insurance. You One or two. I'm diabetic. Dude, I'm telling you. I'm making a list here of all the things we have in common, and it is you ridiculous. From another mother. Seriously. Yeah, so I was like, I had to get health insurance because I I was uninsurable, you know. Yeah. So I couldn't let I couldn't let health insurance lapse. And the company that I worked for was too small to have Cobra, the the um, furniture store that fired me. Um, so I had to find something fast, and so I got a job at a department store. And at first, they put me in the men's department. Um, and, but I wasn't making enough commission mm -hmm. and cosmetics pays r really well. There's really good commission in cosmetics. And, um, I never wear makeup or hardly ever makeup. I wore makeup for your interview today. Thank um, you. I'm honored. <laughs> um, and, uh, so it is a requirement if you work in cosmetics to wear makeup. Uh, but I, st I studied art in college. I'm like, if I can paint a painting, I can paint some music, <laughs> I right? can paint a face. So I, yeah. I can do this. Um, so yeah. So I sold, I, I was a makeup artist for a while and like, this was the economy was in the toilet. Right. So, so my family lives in a small town. There just wasn't like the, the volume of business for me to make enough money. So then I got a job further away in a city, um, but I was commuting. And so, you know, uh, then the gas prices like shot up and I couldn't afford the commute anymore. So then I did sales at a cemetery. Oh, they, like, do you, does your, like, is this? I mean, that's weird shit, right? Like, like how I often mean, does it come up, right? This is like, if you're making a movie, this is, a, this is a movie, right? Like you are, right. this is like, we talk about peaks and valleys. We talk about the yin and the yang. We talk about having good so we can appreciate the struggle, et cetera, et cetera. But um, I mean, in this, in this, you know, kind of chunk of the movie. This is some rough shit. You're, you're recently. No, I tell you what, the, the worst sales job is a job where you wake up in the morning and you think, God, I hope somebody dies today. But Someone you know, to do it. Someone's got to do it. 
someone's got to do right. it. But it doesn't feel good. It uh, doesn't feel good. Uh, so, um, so then eventually I ended up a sales manager at an electronics and appliance store. Um, and then general manager there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, what I discovered that in all of this, um, like I said, there was stuff I liked about business, um, but there was stuff I didn't like. And boy, some of it was really rough, right? Um, they tried to deny me maternity leave uh, under the key employee exemption. Uh, my boss would take out the assistant manager that worked under me for lunch whenever he came into town, but he didn't take me out for lunch. Like, the yeah, story is crazy. building. Things are, bec- yeah, things are becoming clear. Stuff. Like, because you and I talked before this briefly, but like, you know, the, I had, I had asked a while back, like why the B Corp and you, we didn't answer it. But I'm starting to see. Yeah. I'm starting to see why I'm, it's building over these years and these experiences, positive and negative. I'm, it's starting to become a little bit clear as to like, kind of sounds like you went through some shit, and then you had the opportunity to create something that would help people be guarded from that and create a better yeah, opportunity so, for people. So what's really funny is so so in, along the way I met my husband. And um, I got married and he already had a child from his first marriage. So it was like an instant family. And um, and I'd, I'd never really planned to have kids of my own, but then she was pretty great. Um, and then we went on our honeymoon. And um, when we came back from Italy, we had a Lorenzo souvenir. So... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, well said. So, okay. Read between the lines. She got pregnant on the honeymoon. Okay, got it. Got yeah, it, got yeah. It. Okay, so, okay. Um, so, <laughs> so then what's weird is like they were had such a bad experience with the company I was working for with all of all of that um, that I decided to go back to nonprofits. So uh, because I'm like, you know what, this is evil. I whatever, I'm going to go back to what I know. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, there was an opportunity that came up of the town we were living in the, the art center there. Uh, the executive director had misappropriated half a million dollars. Chicago stuff right there. Oh, well it's everywhere. (laughs) Right. So, um, so I saw it in the paper and, uh, two weeks postpartum, I make a few phone calls, shoot an email and I'm like, this is a, a small town in Ohio. Uh, I'm like, I know you don't have any museum executives here, right? Like, I'm the only one who can do this job, right? Uh-huh. So two weeks postpartum, I reach out to the uh, president of the board, and I'm like, hey, it looks like you need a director. Uh, here's my resume. I think I could help you out. So I did a job interview. I was still, like, my stomach was, like, still, you know, like, I'm like, I... We went to TJ Maxx and like trying to find a dress that, that I could wear that I don't look pregnant in because it's literally two weeks after I gave birth. Oh my birth gosh, Tracy. Job. Yeah. So, so I do a turnaround at this nonprofit. Um, and once I get in there, not only did he misappropriate half a million dollars, but he also had another half a million dollars of grants that he, they'd received uh, the funding for, but he hadn't executed on the grant. Ooh, that's so not we're good. like a million dollars upside down. Um, and uh, this isn't the, the I, I'm not, it's not a community I know. I'd moved there because of my husband. Uh, and so I, uh, I come in and I get forgiveness on a lot of those grants. I negotiate forgiveness. I fundraise the heck out of everything. And in 18 months, I totally had the the whole thing turned around. Wow. Plus uh, half of the next year's budget in the bank on January 15th. However, Not. corruption like that is never isolated, right? It doesn't go on that long without other people knowing. Uh-huh. And so I became aware that there were some board members that were involved or aware and hadn't done the right thing. And so when I brought that to the attention of the board, they eliminated my position. Going up against the mob now. Yeah, kind of. I mean, except it's just rich people who have, who don't want to look bad, you know? So, 
So now I've got like a, you know, like a 18 month old or whatever. Uh, and I'm unemployed from the only job in my field. Uh, and I'm like, what am I going to do? Right. And I was just so lost. But one of the thing, one of the grants I've been working on before I left that job was uh, the Ohio Arts Council had um, an arts and economic economic opportunity program they were running. And hmm. so I had, I had written a grant where we were going to teach uh, business classes to artists. Much um, needed. Yeah. So no, much. I'm serious. There's a whole, you know, there's oh. a whole field of study around creatives, not being the great business people and that they, yes. So this is much needed. Yeah. yeah. So, and there's actually big surprise. There's already like research and curriculum around this. Uh, we just need to get it in the hands of the right people. So, uh, a consultant that I had met uh, while working on that grant and who became a friend of mine uh, sort of reached out to me after after that uh, position came to an end. And she was like, you know, what are you going to do? I was like, I don't know, like I'm applying to everything, but, you know, it's complicated. Uh, so, you know, it's the only job in this town. And, you know, the custody arrangement we had for my stepdaughter, like we really couldn't leave without separating the kids. Mm. and. You know, all the things, you know, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, you know, and she's like, why don't you just do something of your own? And I was like, like, what? That's a jump. You know, like, what would I do? You know? Yeah. And she's like, you're really good at this stuff, right? Like, people will pay you for the strategy and the things that you do, right? And so I, I didn't, you know, it's one of those was sort of like a little seed, right? So that was a nice idea, but I didn't really know what I would do with it. But I kept applying for jobs and, you know, not getting too far. But in the meantime, people started reaching out to me for consulting because part of what I had to do in that turnaround was a lot of marketing and PR to rebuild. We sure. had to establish some credibility for that organization in order for me to raise the money I needed to keep it afloat. So I had, I was hustling hard to rebuild that brand and build some trust in the community so that we could, you know, write the ship. And so people started reaching out to me, Hey, can you consult on this social media thing? Can you consult on this, you know, press release? Can you, so I was doing these little bits of consulting and was freelance writing and I was, you know, doing these, you know, things. And at some point I was like, you know, I do kind of have a business here. And you the know? interesting thing when somebody says to you, and, and again, like backing up classroom teacher, working in the museums, selling any, you know, go, there's all these things that you've done. And then there comes a point where somebody says, people will pay you for the way that you think. Right. Which is very right. unique. If you've, if you've come from these disparate, you know, careers where it is, it's kind of binary. You're either getting paid for your hours, you're getting paid for a deliverable, you know, like you're, that's it. And you're like, oh, wait, just you pay me for what's in here so I can tell you what I would do. And like, yes, that is a that is a groundbreaking moment for many people. So I'm glad that you had it. And so how do you yeah. then decide going in on yourself? So um, I made all the dumb mistakes. I actually created a journal um, that I called stupid shit. I did my first year in business, publish it, um, publish it, make it a PDF, publish it. Let's it go wrote stuff down uh, as it happened. But <laughs> I tried to do too many things. I did take a part-time job doing some fundraising in the nonprofit space and started like two businesses at once. So, and ran them concurrently until the wow. pandemic. So started a photo studio co-op kind of thing. So photographers could rent a professional's photo studio space as needed uh, rather than having the overhead of, of having one studio, of their own or sure. they could be a member. Yeah. Um, and then also, you know, doing, you know, marketing and PR consulting as well. The photo studio, we also taught like photography classes and things like that. Uh, so eventually the part-time job was not compatible with the other two businesses. So I think I only did that maybe six months or something, but it, it did feel safer. <laughs> um, and then I ran the two businesses concurrently until the pandemic. And then there, the photo studio was just, there, there was no yeah. way to do it during the shutdown. And it became really clear that it was a whole lot easier for me to grow my business when I was just doing one business. Was it called uh, Graziani Multimedia at that time? Or what was it called? The photo studio was called Togloft, T-O-G. Okay. Got it. Like, short for photographer. 
uh, and then Grazia Any Multimedia was was always so we became HubSpot partners nine years ago or something like wow. that. Like, so we now see the pathway <clears throat> to entrepreneurship. We kind of can see underlying here like why the B Corp, right? So that you can kind of make sure that people are getting a living wage or treating the people part of the, I think you said it was people, people, profit, and planet, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Planet. Yeah. So we can see where the, I don't know if altruistic is the right word, but it's the word, it's like the, the doing good while doing well. Like I can see where that's important for you now. Um, sure. But there's another layer here. We got we got a few minutes left here, but I, I have to talk about this because it came up the first time that we spoke um, and I forgot how it came up, but it, it essentially it was around being a women led business. Right. This idea that like it's 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 hard enough being an entrepreneur. It's hard enough trying to kind of like eat what you hunt and kill, so to speak. But, you know, but like or, or grow. Maybe that's a better metaphor. It's easier to eat what you plant and harvest and give love and light to. But um there's a whole nother, I feel probably challenge. There's a whole nother unset of like set of challenges of being a, a, um, a female founder, right? And we talked about the people we know in common that are really these amazing, not only just amazing founders, they're great people. <laughs> they're just great people, um, both like in the HubSpot ecosystem and without. So as you now are start, you start your own business, you you shut down. Um, uh, fog loft, did you call it? Tog loft? Yeah. Photographer, right? Mm -hmm. And now yeah. you're all in on Graziani Multimedia. So how does this now start to kind of, and what are those challenges that start to pop up that you're like, hey, would this happen if I was male? Like, what is the bullshit that you're seeing? And I'm sure this could be another three hours. I'm just starting to like uncover here. There's a whole other thing here we need to chat about. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. So obviously, long before I had my own business, I knew that I get treated differently in the workplace by being a woman. Right. But I think when I started it, I'm like, hmm, this is like the cheat code. I can get get around it now because like I don't have a jerk boss anymore. I am the boss. Unless I'm a jerk, then we're good. Right. Um, which would be nice. And, and I don't I wouldn't say I was that like, you know, naive about it, but it did feel safer. Right. To, to finally, you know, to finally have a business that was built around my values and, and, and to me, how people are treated was the, one of the most important things, you know, sort of above everything else. And, and like, I, I wrote a manifesto for the company, you know, before I had employees, I mean, it was just too important to me to make it, you spend too much time at work. Um, and I never wanted to make anybody feel the way I felt. Um, but it was really interesting when five or so years into the business, my husband joined me in the business. Um, so uh, his first day on the job, I had a meeting with a client that I'd already been working with and he would have, I planned on having him work on the project. So I had him come to the meeting and this was like, you know, when we did more stuff in person, right? Mm -hmm. So we go into the conference room, the, the client three people from the client are at the table, my husband and I, we sit down and these are people I'd worked with before. And his presence at the table changed everything. Suddenly, every question they had, they directed to him. And then he would be like, I don't know, I just started on this account like five minutes ago. Hey, Tracy, what do you think about this? And then they, you know, every, like it, I became invisible to people I'd already been working with and had built, I thought, a trusting, re respectful relationship with. Right. And suddenly I bring a guy in and I, be I just disappeared. And it was surreal. It was so surreal. It was unbelievable to see like, and I, obviously it's like subconscious, right? Like they didn't know they were doing it either, right? Like that's the trick with, with bias, bias right? Like, yeah. I'm sure they didn't realize they were doing that. It's like you they know, were unaware that they were unaware. They were unaware sure. of what they were doing and unaware of the bias that they had, right? And if I had pointed it out to them, which there would be no point, right? But if I had pointed it out, they would have been like, no, no I didn't do that. You know, why would I do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, there's, there's this, like, I hated the book Lean In when it came out. 
because I bought it thinking it was going to be one thing and then it was another. And, and what bothered me about it and about a lot of the stuff that's out there for women in business is putting a lot of the onus on us to be different, to advocate for ourselves, to this or that, as if we're, we as women are the, the problem, problem or, yeah. or can fix the problem. And I'm not convinced we can fix a problem people aren't aware of. When, when the dudes sitting at that table don't realize that they ignored me once an, another man was sitting across them at the table, mm. my, my bringing that up or my advocating for myself is not going to fix it. What fixes it is when the other men in the room who are aware of what's happening do the right thing and say, actually, my colleague, my teammate, my whatever, you know, and they redirect the conversation back and, and model the behavior that needs to happen. Like that, that works. Otherwise, you're just the angry feminist or you're the whatever you want to hear people say about, you've heard all those things, so I don't need to repeat them. Yeah. Right. So, so I think that, I think it's, it's like, I also believe, by the way, racism is a, is a problem white people have to fix, right? Like we have to fix that. We have to own that because we are that problem, you know? In the same way, sexism is not something I can fix because I'm I'm not I'm not a part of the problem. <laughs> you know, right. the the bull the the kid getting bullied is not the one to fix the bullying, right? Like that has to right. start on the yeah the right. and you. Yeah, I mean, you can stand up for yourself, right? Like I will say, like when it comes to being a bully, right? You do you know if you're being bullied, you do have to you right. you you do benefit from standing up for yourself. And I, I will be the difficult woman in a situation because I am not going to be a doormat, but I'm also not going to be unrealistic about it and, and believe that I can change things that are, that are outside of the realm of what's realistic. And, and really it's just not my, it's not my job. Right. Like, I think oh, hold on one. one of you, what I can do is. I can coach and empower and, and build up other women and help them succeed. And, and so that's why I, you know, I think somebody might've mentioned to you the, the lioness group that I started years ago of, of women HubSpot agency owners. But to me, it was like, we need a good old girls club, just like guys have a good old boys club, mm -hmm. right? Like, like I really felt like what we really needed was to support each other and that there would be a lot more to be gained from that. And so I, I see a lot of value in that. I think, you know, there's that expression, you can't be it if you can't see it. So I think it's, I think it's really valuable to surround myself with other women who are leading companies and, and to take that as an opportunity to learn and grow from one another. And then also the women in my company empowering and encouraging them and helping them to grow. You know, I have an employee that when she started working for us, the one thing she said in her interview, because I always keep all that stuff, was like, I never want to supervise people. She's like, I just want to come do my job and go home. And I was like, okay, that's fine. And there are people who are absolutely I see, yeah. individual contributors yeah. and whatever. But real quickly, I realized she had leadership potential all over the place. Like the first week on the job, I was like, she's 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 got what it takes mm -hmm. and other people listen when she talks like she brings something really great and in so to me it was like i'm going to cultivate her to be a leader and i'm going to encourage her and i'm going to give her opportunities and i'm going to set her up to succeed in all these ways and if she never wants it she doesn't have to take it but i bet when the time comes and i say hey would you like a promotion i bet we're going to be able to make that happen and 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 we were. And so, you know, I get to this point and I said, Hey, I know when you started working here, I, you know, like 18 months ago or whatever, you're like, you never wanted to do this, but have you noticed how this, 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 and this behavior? Have you noticed how these things happen? And she's like, yeah. And I was like, well, would you be interested in stepping into that more? I know you said you didn't want that before, but would you be open to it now? And she was like, yeah, absolutely. You know, so I don't know. I, I may never be Nancy Jones, but I'm going to try to be the Nancy Jones to, to as many people as I can be as I move on. This idea, it's not an idea, this mission that you have, you know, that, that has just kind of evolved and come to you over time around, you know, being the change, right? 
You're not the one to solve the problem, but you're not going to stand by and be a doormat. And then there's specific actions you took, founding a group for female founders, really empowering people when you see them to become the best versions of themselves, specifically the females that we hire, right? That, you know, we only have this much time in a day, right? We only get this many hours. We only get this much attention. My assumption here is that that type of internal work, and it takes really good intention and attention. So as you grow your business, as you continue to evolve, do you now see that this is just part of what you do and it's baked into your your hours and the work that you do? Do you think that as you forecast in future set that there might be something more around this for you? What are you thinking about the future? So yeah, I do think that's why I like started with like a manifesto at the very beginning, right? Because it does just have to be in your DNA as a as a business, as a leader, as a person. You know, because I think that like you know, inclusion and coaching and all of those are not things you do, it's who you are. And and those are very and I think that's the difference um you know, like we we in a previous conversation we talked about you know, a horrible, you know, cliche people talk about is when companies say, oh, you know, we're like a family and it makes you cringe. Right. Um, and I always, and I always say that actually, I feel like as an employer, I have a responsibility to make this place better than a family, you know, because a family you did not choose. And even the best families have dysfunction in the fabric of what they are. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are a lot of reasons why we are loyal to and committed to and stick with our families, whether or not that's good or healthy or any of those things, right? It it is a whole soup of stuff. And so no wonder nobody would want their work to be a family, Family. right? Yeah, that's interesting. A very complicated ecosystem. But work is something that we can, to a large extent, not entirely, we can control. And so to me, your job, we should be better than your family. You know, we should consistently treat people well and and hold everyone to a standard of that. The best review that my company has ever received that I appreciate so much was one of our clients when they reviewed us in, in the HubSpot partner directory mm-hmm. said that, you know, not only are we, you know, competent, do a good job, whatever it was, but, but the staff at Graziani Multimedia are kind, not nice, not friendly, not good customer service, but kind. By doing good while you do well, there's, there's no rule that says in business that you can't make people feel good and you can't do things the right way and be a good human. And I think this is like, as I think now, holistically looking back at your story, things make sense now right? It's like that old Steve Jobs quote. We try to connect the dots moving forward, right? You were handed some pretty shitty dots, right? You know, right? Like, like, but now looking back on it, it all makes sense. The skills that you learn selling, uh, you know, in the appliances and selling the cemetery, and selling, all these things now have come together to make you who you are today. And I would assume that your clients, your community members, or employees and teammates are so appreciative of who you are and what you provide for them, both as a B Corp, as a woman founded, woman led company in the way that you're doing your work. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you for sharing your story. This was, you know, the show's called Think Differently. It's about people that think differently and challenge the status quo. Sometimes we challenge the status quo out of um, objectively, we say we want to. Sometimes it's in our DNA and sometimes we just navigate our way through life and realize we see injustice and then we take a stand against it. And I think this is all just beautifully crafted and to make you who you are. I cannot wait to see you in Boston in like less than a month. I can't wait. Thank you for making the time today. Is there anything folks should do following up from this conversation? Is there anything you need help with anything you're trying to do that we can help with and listeners can go do something or reach out to you, anything at all? Hmm. Well, I mean, I do think that, everybody could just stand to be kinder to one another. That's an easy, it's, it, it's the, it's uh well, it's not easy, but it's free. And uh, it's something we can all do. I think I started as a teacher and I think that's where I've, en- you know, ended up coming back to as a, in, in my career, the, the thing we're doing at Grazani Multimedia that I'm most excited about now is uh, our revenue revolution 
uh, program where we are focusing on uh, coaching and training more uh, with our clients, especially around sales. And um, since I've sold everything from Girl Scout cookie to, to cemetery plots, um, I, I know a few <laughs> things. Uh, and I also have this really great tool set with HubSpot. And my favorite part of my work is really uh, coaching and teaching and training people and seeing them succeed. You know, we've got a, we've got a client that had a salesperson that was in danger of losing their job. They went through the revolution, revenue revolution program. And not only did he get to keep his job, but he bonused, you know, and he hadn't made goal in four months. Like, wow. You know, and that makes a big difference in somebody's life, you know? Yeah. I mean, their livelihood. Where do people go to get involved with this to learn more? Where should we direct people to? Sure. So uh, revenue-revolution.com, you can sign up for our newsletter. Okay. And um, and so that's where you can just get some fun information, you know, learn about our program. And then our company website is graziannimultimedia.com. Thank you so much, Tracy. I will see you in a month, but thank you awesome. for sharing so authentically, so genuinely, so deeply. And um, we, we all know you a little bit better now. And when we know people, <laughs> good things happen. So everybody listening, the takeaway is to just be kind. Thank you so much, Tracy. Yep. Thank you.